Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One King, one Husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches, back to the days of the gold rush, with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet... The Challenge of the Yukon. Here's my idea of someone who's really smart. It's the person who sees to it that there's a supply of Quaker puffed rice or wheat on hand at all times. These ready-to-serve cereals hit the spot morning, noon, or night. They taste so swell because they're shot from guns. Exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. Wheat or rice shot from guns is nourishing, too. Makes a thrifty, easy-to-fix deluxe family breakfast with milk and fruit. Yes, here's a treat you'll want to repeat. That's Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. It was nearly midnight when Sergeant Preston shouted to command the king. Gee, king! The great dog turned to the right and led the team up the creek bank and into the little town of Gold Flats. King was working as a loose lead, breaking trail through the freshly fallen snow. And suddenly he swerved aside and headed straight for a warehouse on the left side of the street. The team followed as a matter of course. What's the matter, boy? Hold it, hold it! The dog stopped just short of a white mound in the shadow of the building whined nervously as the sergeant ran up to join him. Something here you want me to look at, boy? He saw at once that it was the figure of a man. And after he had brushed away the snow... He's dead, King. He's been shot. Shot in the back. We'll put him on the sled and take him to Jim's cabin. The sergeant always stayed with old Jim Hanley while he was in Gold Flats. And a few minutes later, they reached his cabin near the row of cafes that lined the main street. Oh, King! Oh, King! Oh, King! Yes, Jim. Uh, What have you got on the sled? A man. A dead man. Jump into your horse, I'll give you a hand, Sergeant. All right. We can put him on that cart in the corner. There. I'll close the door. Bring that lamp over, Jim. I got it right here. Do you know him? I sure do. It's Matt Barrett. This is a harsh thing to say about anyone, Sergeant, but it's good riddance. Why do you say that? He was a bully for one thing and for another. Well, you've come here to investigate that express company robbery. Yes? I'd had to point him out as one of the men we suspect. Who are the others? Jeff Martin and the men who hang around with him. Jeff and Matt were partners in all kinds of devilment. Could there have been a falling out between them? Not only could have been, there was. They had a knockdown, drag-out fight at the Monte Carlo last night. Jeff got the worst of it, and he swore he'd get even. Then we must suspect him of murder as well as robbery. Looks like it to me. But this is one time a bullet did some good. Crime's been committed, Jim. It's my job to see the criminals punished. I wish you luck, Sergeant. You'll find that Jeff is a tough customer, though, and smart. He covers his tracks. Snow covered the killer's tracks. How long ago did it stop snowing here? About two hours. The shot was fired sometime before that, and not very long before... There was only a thin layer of snow covering the body. I don't suppose anyone could have heard the shot if it was blowing as hard here as it was on the trail. It was blowing all right, Sergeant. A little before 10 o'clock. Well, first thing to do is find out where Jeff Martin was then. It's early. If he's in town, most likely you'll find him in one of the cafes. I'll take a look. Let's go, King. The Sergeant King left the cabin, and 10 minutes later they found Jeff in the back room of the Monte Carlo. There were several hard-faced men sitting around the table with him. The sergeant ordered them out of the room, and then... Well, sergeant, you look mighty serious. I am. (laughs) Somebody's been suggesting that I had something to do with the express company robbery, is that it? That's part of it. Well, they're all wrong. I wasn't even in town the night it took place. But you were in town tonight. Uh, Sure. Where? Between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. Right here. I haven't left this table. 
You can ask any of the boys. So what, uh, what happened between 9.30 and 10? A man was murdered. Say, that's bad. The man's name was Matt Barrett. <laughs> Matt's been killed? Well, Sergeant, that's more than bad. It's terrible. Matt was just about the best friend I had in the world. Oh? You weren't too friendly last night. Oh, you mean that little fight we had in here? Why, it didn't mean a thing, Sergeant. You were beaten up and you swore you'd get even. Well, I may have said something like that, but I wasn't serious. And Matt was a pal, a partner. And believe me, Sergeant, I... I sure hope you find the man who killed him. I'll do my best. Sure. And I'll do everything I can to help you. Just don't try to leave town, Jeff. Of course not. I want to help. You can start by sending in those men who were here. All of them? All of them. One at a time. The sure thing. The sergeant spent the next two hours in questioning all the men in the cafe. The few who had been playing cards with Jeff swore that he had never left the back room. From the others, he learned that Matt had been in the cafe shortly before he was killed. But there was no evidence to establish the identity of the killer. Matt was buried the following morning. And afterwards, as they ate their midday meal, the sergeant and Jim discussed the case. Uh, it was Jeff, sergeant. If he didn't do it himself, he hired someone to do it. You said he was smart. I can't arrest him, Jim. His alibi's too good. Ah, those friends of his would swear to anything. Now, there's an outside door in that back room of the Monte Carlo. He could have slipped out for a few minutes. Yes, I know, Jim. But then we come to another question. How do you know where to find Matt? And what was Matt doing on the edge of town during a blizzard? Was he leaving town? Was he... What's the King? Does he want to go out? No, I think there's someone at the door. Well, nobody knocked. I'll see. Hey, Marie, come back. Did you want to see me? No, I... it is better if I do not. What kind of talk is that? Now, come on in here. All right. I will. But it is the sergeant I must talk to. Well, he's right here. Oh, uh, uh, Sergeant, this is Marie Fontaine. How do you do? Bonjour, monsieur. Now, sit down, Marie, and make yourself comfortable. Merci. You uh, seem to be worried about something. Oh, I am, monsieur. I'm afraid. Well, you don't have to be afraid of the sergeant. It is about my husband. Has something happened to him? He is... No, I... I do not know what to say. Well, Marie, just tell the sergeant whatever it is that's troubling you. It's his job to help people. That's true, Marie. But Pierre made me promise to say nothing. And yet I feel that he is wrong. It is not right to know such things and keep them a secret. To know what things? My husband is the watchman at the warehouse. Marie, it's something about last night. Something about the murder. You know who did it? No, monsieur, I do not. But your husband does. He has gone away. He is afraid he will be killed if it is known that he knows. A man who will shoot once will shoot twice. Marie, if you have any information at all, it's your duty to tell me. I'm an officer of the law and I'm here to protect you. That is what I believe, monsieur. Tell me then. Pierre was in the warehouse when the shot was fired. Yes? Even above the noise of the storm, he heard it. And he ran to the door and opened it. He saw a man lying in the snow. And kneeling beside him is another man... He lights a match, and for a second, Pierre can see his face. It is a short time only, and the match is blown out. Who was that man? I do not know. Pierre knew him? We. Oui. He would not tell me who he was, though. Go on. What else did he say? The man disappeared in the storm. Pierre went to the man lying in the snow. He was dead. Pierre locked the warehouse and came home to me. He was afraid that if he said nothing of what he saw, the police might arrest him for the murder. And if he told the truth, the other man might kill him. It seemed to him best that he'd go away. Where, Marie? Where's he gone? To Forty Mile. You're sure? We, oui. I was to stay here and find out what happened. Then I was to join him there. What does Pierre look like? Well, well he's he... kind of small, Sergeant. Dark curly hair and mustache. Pierre Fontaine. That's right. What was he wearing, Marie? The clothes for the tray. What kind of a parka? It is made of deer skin. We'll find him. and We'll bring him back. Don't say anything about this to anyone, Marie. Oh, no. And don't worry. No one's going to hurt your husband. Please. Please let it be so, monsieur. Let's go, King. We're hitting the trail. We'll continue our story in just a moment. 
You know, big game hunters may go for a special high-powered rifle when it comes to shooting elephants or lions or tigers. But say, let me tell you about another kind of gun that everyone goes for. It's the gun that shoots Quaker-puffed wheat and Quaker-puffed rice. Yes, sirree. When you've a big day ahead, long hours at school or playing football or games, you need to stow away a good breakfast. So tomorrow, start the day by eating a heaping bowl full of Quaker-puffed wheat or rice with plenty of milk and fruit. These nutritious, delicious, ready-to-serve cereals furnish extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. What's more, they're really keen-tasting. They're shot from guns to make them crisp and tender. Yes, these giant-size, king-size grains of premium wheat or rice are actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. That's why Quaker puffed rice and wheat are so popular with so many He-Men Hollywood movie stars. Ask Mom for wheat or rice shot from guns. Remember, it's never sold in bags or bulk. Always buy the famous big Quaker red and blue package to get the original crisp, fresh Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Now to continue our story. A few minutes after Sergeant Preston heard the end of Marie's story, the dog team was harnessed and he was driving out of town in the direction of 40 Mile. Lefty Wade, one of Jeff Martin's cronies, saw him leave. He saw Marie and Jim standing in the doorway of Jim's cabin. And a few minutes later, he stopped the woman as she walked down the street toward her own cabin. Howdy, Marie. Where's the sergeant going? I think it is the direction of Dawson he takes. Oh, you're wrong. He's heading north. Oh, that is true. Seems to be in a big hurry. Maybe. You must excuse me. I am in a big hurry. Too. Well, uh, I'll just walk along with you. Have a talk with Pierre. No, you cannot. Why? He is not at home. Well, I'll come along and wait for him. It will do you no good. He is out of town. I didn't think I'd seen him around today. He is not here. Excuse him, Moi. <laughs> yeah, sure. Lefty watched Marie as she walked on down the street. Then he headed for the Monte Carlo, where he found Jeff standing at the bar. Hey, Jeff, let's sit down and back. It's important. Okay. Yeah, this is all right. Sit down. What are you so nervous about? I just saw the money drive out of town. Yeah? You mean for good? I don't think it's for good at all. Marie Fontaine was over at Jim Henley's cabin where he's been staying. What of it? Maybe she gave him a tip. About what? Marie doesn't know anything. Pierre's a watchman at the warehouse. He must have been there last night. I tell you, nobody saw Yeah, but how can you be sure, Jeff? Pierre isn't at home. He's out of town. Then he wasn't at the warehouse. How could he see me? He was here all day yesterday, and I want to know why he cleared out. Doesn't look good to me, Jeff. If Pierre saw you and the money's gone after him, then you'd better... But it would well, run away, I suppose, huh? It might be safer. I'll decide that for myself. All right. It's your funeral. I'll find out how the cards lay before I throw in my hand. Now, you get Marie and take her up to Old Town. Huh? You heard me. What do you want with her up there? I want to find out how much she knows. Oh, she won't come with me. You can persuade her. Take her to the old dance hall. The boys and I will be waiting for you there. Okay. With King breaking the trail, Sergeant Preston made the trip to 40 Mile in a little over two hours. It took him another hour to find Pierre and persuade the Frenchman that he must return to Gold Flats and tell the truth about what he had seen. Pierre, decent law-abiding citizens like you will never be safe unless you do everything you can to put criminals where they belong. But no, Sasha. I think of my Marie. Who was the man you saw, Pierre? Tell me and I'll arrest him. He'll go to jail, he'll be tried for murder, and he'll be convicted. Who was it? It was... It was Jeff Martin. And you'll testify to that in court? Uh, I will tell the truth about what I saw. Good. We will start for gold flats in the morning. We'll start this minute. It will soon be night. King knows the trail, don't you, boy? And you'll get us there fast, won't you? Come on, Pierre! The early dusk of the Northland overtook them on the trail a few miles outside of 40 Mile. But then the moon rose, and the northern light sweeping across the sky made the night like day. The miles flew by. 
when the flats were reached, the sergeant called to the team to halt in front of Pierre's cabin. Halting! Halting! The cabin is dark. She is not here. Make sure, Pierre. She may be waiting in Jim's place. Uh, we. Marie? Marie? No, she is not here. Come along, then. We'll find her at Jim's. I hope so. All set? We. Untangle! On your feet! There was a light in Jim's window, but there was no answer to the sergeant's knock. The door was unlocked, however, and when he and Pierre and King entered the cabin, they saw a note propped up by the oil lamp on the table. I wonder where he could have gone. The paper does not say? Yes, it does. Who's Lefty Wade, Pierre? Uh, he's a friend of Jeff Martin's. I remember now. He's one of the men who said that Jeff didn't leave the bank room at the Monte Carlo last night. Uh, they are all crooks. What is it you have read about Lefty Wade? Bad news. Listen. Saw Marie leaving town with Lefty Wade heading for the hills. I'm following them. The hills? They have taken a prisoner. What's in the hills? Where were they going? <laughs> There's nothing but the old town. No one lives here now. It's a place where Jeff Martin might Your go Your wife to... doesn't know it was Jeff who shot Matt. It does not matter. They will kill her. I don't think so, Pierre. Not when they realize she knows so little. I'm going after her. And I. I too must come. No, Pierre. You must stay here. As soon as I leave, bar the door and don't let anyone in until I get back. My wife. You will promise to bring her back? I, I promise. All right, King. <laughs> It was at just about that moment when Jim Hanley reached the old town. The place seemed to be completely deserted, but the tracks of the sled he had been following led to the dance hall. With his gun ready, Jim drove directly up to it. He climbed the steps cautiously and crossed the wide veranda. Only a few short years ago, this building had been the center of a boom town. Now it was a ghostly shell. Not a light shone anywhere. And yet Jim knew that somewhere, somewhere close, he tried the door. It opened. He stepped inside. It was too dark for him to see anything. He struck a match. All right, Ben, get him. No, you don't. You're dead. Look out, he's got a gun. No, he hasn't. I've got it. What do we do with him? Tie his hands behind his back. How about some light now? Sure, light the lamp. Where's Marie? What have you done with her? Don't worry about her. You better worry about yourself. What's the idea of following me up here? Where is she? She's where you nor anybody else will find her. Not until we get good and ready to let her go. Tighten up those knots, Joe. Oh, yeah. Crooks the law to you. <laughs> I don't mind you saying it, as long as you can't prove it. We keep Marie here to make sure Pierre doesn't talk. The sergeant's little trip to 40 Mile won't do him any good. You made her tell you. That was easy. She doesn't like to be hurt. Well, you can win. You're going to jail, every one of you. For what? For robbery and murder. Hasn't he talked enough? Let him. I want him to. I suppose you left word where you were going. Yes, I did. And it won't be long before the sergeant gets here. <laughs> we'll be waiting for him. Joy, you and Pete stand guard out in front. You'll be able to see him coming up the trail just like you saw Jim. Now take your rifles and let them have it. Right, all right. But when the sergeant reached a point on the trail where he could see the ghost town, he realized that to show himself on the open slope below would make him a perfect target. He stopped the team. Okay. Oh, no. King was relieved. His sure instinct told him there was danger lurking in the silent buildings. He also knew that such a threat would never stop his master when there was work to be done. But this stop meant they would proceed with caution. And it's too bright to keep on going this way, King. <laughs> there was another way, though. Half a mile to the east, a wooded draw led to the top of the ridge. The ridge itself was wooded, and it was possible to travel along it until a point was reached just above the town. The back way looks better to me, boy. <laughs> the sergeant left the team behind and started for the draw with King. It was hard forcing their way through the tangled underbrush to the top of the draw, and the climb took them nearly half an hour. Travel was easier on the top of the ridge. But here, the firs grew close together, and neither the moon nor the aurora could penetrate the darkness. Hard to see, but we can be sure they can't see us. At last, a point was reached directly above and behind the dance hall. 
The sergeant started down toward it. But unaccountably, King held back. No, uh, something wrong, boy? King had found a freshly made trail, and he felt that the sergeant should investigate it. I ask him, footprints. The sergeant knelt down and examined them closely with the aid of a shielded match. Some of these were made by a woman, and they're headed up the slope. All right, King, let's follow it. Go on. King started up with the sergeant directly behind him. A few minutes later, a glimmer of light showed through the trees. A cabin. The cabin was so completely hidden by the trees that it couldn't be seen more than 20 feet away. Silently, the sergeant and King advanced toward the single window. The sergeant looked inside. The faint beam of a candle lit the face of a man who was dozing as he sat with his feet propped on the table. This is going to be easy, King. A dark form could be seen lying on the floor. Let's hope we're not too late. Where's the sergeant threw open the door of the cabin. Up with your hands. I'll take your gun. What's the idea? You're under arrest in the name of the queen. You can't arrest me. If you don't think so, these handcuffs should prove it. I haven't done anything. We'll see what Mrs. Fontaine has to say about that. I'll take this guy out first, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Now I'll get your ropes. I thought every minute they were going to kill me. Have you seen Jim? He was coming up the slope toward the town. They were waiting for him. They took me away before he got there. I do not know what they did to him, but I have heard no shooting. Thank you. I'll help you up. They are free. Where was it they were waiting for Jim? In the dance hall. Jeff and left his own feet. This is the one they call Butch. I'll tie him up before I leave. You'll have to wait here until I get back, Marie. You go to the dance hall? Yes. But it will be four against one. Four against two. You're forgetting King. Oh. We'll try not to let them know we're coming. There is something you should see here. Under the table, Sergeant, there is a box. Oh. I saw it as I was lying on the floor. It is the kind of box the express company uses to ship gold. I have seen them many times. There's nothing in that box. Which means there must be. There. There it is, Sergeant. Good work, Marie. This is the gold they stole. I didn't have anything to do with it. But Matt Barrett did. That's right. And he wasn't satisfied with his share. It, it, it wasn't that. He wanted to leave town. He wanted his split, and Jeff said no. He started up here after. All the gold's there, Sergeant. Jeff wouldn't let us touch an ounce of it. Oh? Well, I mean... So you didn't have anything to do with it? I didn't. I was up here on the night of the robbery. You can explain that to the judge. Now I'm going to tie your feet and gag you. In a few minutes, Butch was lying helpless on the floor. The sergeant and King retraced their steps down the wooded slope of the ridge. The rear of the dance hall was in deep shadow from the trees, and it was impossible for the sergeant to see if there were any guards posted there. But from King's reactions, he knew the coast must be clear. The rear door was ajar, sagging on its hinges. The sergeant opened it a little more. The rusty hinges protested. The sergeant King stopped, but the sound evidently hadn't been heard. Then they stepped inside into a narrow hallway. Ten feet from the door, a stairway led to the second floor. As the sergeant and King were passing it, they heard voices. I tell you, I heard something out in back. Take a look, Lizzie. Okay. Swiftly, the sergeant and King climbed the stairs. Around the turn at the top, a closed door barred their way, and they waited. Steps echoed in the hallway below them. Where is it, Lizzie? Just the door. It's broken. The wind blew it open. The sergeant opened the door at the head of the stairs, and he and King entered a small room. A stove glowed in one corner. The sergeant could see an old desk, an oil lamp standing on it, and two broken-down chairs. With his hand on King's head, he started for the other door. The great dog understood the need for quiet. The door opened onto a balcony that overlooked the large central room of the dance hall. The faint light from a lamp turned very low left most of the room in complete darkness. Then the front door opened, and a man was silhouetted against the moonlight. Yeah? Yeah. No sign of him. How long does he think I have to stay out here? Until he comes. All night? If necessary, now get back there. Oh. Yeah, no need for me to stay down here. We'll meet everybody. You can call me when you see him. I'm going up to the office and get warm. The sergeant and King slipped back into the office and closed the door. A moment later, Lefty reached the top of the stairs leading up to the balcony from the dance hall. He walked along the balcony to the office and opened the door. The sergeant and King were hidden by it. Lefty started toward the stove. With the odds four to one against him, this was no time for the sergeant to use gentle methods. And he brought the butt of his gun down hard. 
Sergeant Cort left his sagging body and lowered it to the floor. Then he snapped his extra pair of handcuffs around the man's wrist. Quiet, boy. That's only one of them. Sergeant rose and turned toward the door. King couldn't help whimpering. There was a man outside on the balcony. Jeff had come up the stairs after Lefty. What's the matter, King? The door opened. With the... You're covered, Jeff. You're under arrest in the name of the Queen. No, you won't get me. After him, King. Jeff ran for the stairs with King and the sergeant following. But he missed his footing on the first step and started falling. As Jeff yelled, Joe and Pete charged into the dance hall. Jeff, what's the matter? Don't move, you two. You're covered. Sergeant Preston. Up your guns or I'll shoot. Okay, you got it. Stay right where you are. You can't see me, but I can see you. One move and I shoot. Okay. The sergeant descended the stairs. At the bottom, he stepped over Jeff's still form. King was standing guard beside him. The sergeant found the table. With one hand turned up the lamp, which had been burning low. Who's that lying in the corner? Jim Hanley. Untie him. Get that gag off. Yeah, sure. A few minutes later, Jim was free and was holding a gun on Joe and Pete. The sergeant knelt over Jeff. I don't know where Marie is, sergeant. She's in the cabin up above here. She all right? Yes. The man who was guarding her is bound and gagged. You hear that, boys? That's what happens to galoots like you when you're tangled with the Northwest Mounted. Are you men still saying that Jeff did not leave the cafe last night? Well, uh, well, we didn't... Butch uh... has already confessed. If you try to protect Jeff, you'll be a party to his crimes. No, no. We didn't have anything to do with it. He went after Matt all by himself. That's better. How about Jeff, Sergeant? Is, is he dead? Dead? No, Jim, just knocked out. He'll live to answer for what he's done. <laughs> You don't have to worry about him anymore, King. The case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's program. Hey, here's something new and different, too. Hurry, start collecting colorful college pennants or flags of your favorite big-time football teams or schools. Yes, now you can get authentic flags of famous colleges like Notre Dame, California, Army, and Pennsylvania. A special new series of 48 swell color cutouts are out just in time for the football season. You'll get them only with Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the swell-tasting breakfast cereals shot from guns. These college pennants or flags are right on the backs of packages of Quaker Puff Wheat and Rice now at your grocer's. They're yours at no extra cost. Don't miss out. Don't miss out either on the big news. You will hear it soon on this very program. Tell your pals to listen. You're going to have a chance to get a dream prize of a lifetime. So don't be left out. These radio dramas, a feature of the Challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the adventure of Find the Body. We have another exciting story for you on Friday. It's about one of my pals, another Mountie, who disappeared. Inspector Conrad was sure he'd been murdered. Without any facts, I was given the assignment of solving the case. When King and I hit the trail, we headed straight into trouble. It was nip and tuck from then on, a story you won't want to miss. Be sure to hear this exciting story Friday. Till then, this is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and more endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still costs less 